I think it's time to, now time to start. Uh, we are live. Welcome back to the second episode of our new webinar series, ESI, Entrepreneurship, Startups and Innovation. Thank you so much for connecting with us today. I'm Julia Maria Marsan, Area Director for Strategy and Partnership, and I'm here together with TJ, founder of Created Connectors, a Singapore-based startup, and my colleague at Area Lina, uh, to co-host this webinar series, and we are very happy to welcome you back. Today, we continue the conversation that we started uh, during episode one, uh, four weeks ago. During that episode, many participants and also the speakers touched upon the importance of skills for entrepreneurship, for innovation, to create startups. This is a crucial issue everywhere in the world, but particularly in the ASEAN region and in Asia more in general. We know that this region is the region where the digital economy is growing so rapidly, and this trend was accelerated by the pandemic. But to make this growth uh, and these developments su sustainable, we actually need better skills. And this is why, not surprisingly, many countries across the ASEAN region uh, are emphasizing skills in their national economic development strategies. This is, for instance, what's happening uh, almost everywhere in ASEAN. Indonesia is very much emphasizing skill development. Singapore is the leading global example uh, you know, you know, about skills future and other very interesting initiatives developed by the Singaporean government, but also Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, and many more. And just to give an example, I was reading the other day that, for example, in Indonesia, uh, because of the lack of digital skills, Companies are ready to pay between 20 and 30% more for this kind of graduates. And companies are also stepping in to become trainers to basically train the people they want to hire to make sure that they have the right skill set. But in addition to the digital economy, entrepreneurship, innovation, today we will also discuss how skills are important for our own well being, for us as individuals. And this goes beyond uh, economic growth or technology, even if it is clearly related to that. Because better skills mean empowerment and also better opportunities in a lifetime. And this is why today's topic is so important. And finally, let me conclude that I think that uh, uh, the pandemic has also somehow revealed uh, the importance of the need of better skills. Uh, over the last few months, I was sometimes a bit concerned by the allow me this word oversimplification that we can find uh, sometimes on newspapers, sometimes on reports, sometimes, you know, from uh, very reliable sources. Um, this is why some people have referred to the word infodemic beyond to the word pandemic, not to mention fake news. So skills are also very important for equipping people uh, to empowerment to understand when some information is perhaps not 100% reliable or accurate. And these type of skills are becoming more and more important, especially because we spend so much of our time uh, online, reading, working, or studying. Now, before giving the floor to TJ, uh, I just would like to thank uh, our four speakers of today. It's really great to have you with us. Thank you, Jeff, Raffaele, Sin, and Stefan. Uh, and once again, all of you for joining. And let me just very quickly remind you to please keep your microphone muted uh, during the entire duration of the webinar, but uh, use the chat box to interact with us. We want to make this conversation as interactive as possible. So use it to you know, share ideas with us, give us comments, and also to uh, introduce questions for the speakers because we will get back to those later uh, during the Q&A part. And now over to TJ, it's time to start the real conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia, for the introductory remarks. And uh, good day to all our participants, as well as to our speakers. Thank you all for joining us. Um, let me quickly introduce our four distinguished speakers for this session uh, before we launch straight into the questions for the day. First, uh, let me introduce to you Mr. Rafale Trapasso. He is an economist and international civil servant with the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions, and Cities. Here, 
He coordinates the organization's work on higher, ed higher education innovate or HEI innovate and on the geography of higher education. Raffaele has uh, published in several peer reviewed journals and he has co authored several OECD reports focusing on skills policies, green economy, regional development, and open government, among others. Before joining the OECD, he served as the policy advisor to national and local governments. Thanks very much, Rafaele, for joining us today. My next speaker is Mr. Jeff Sandu. He is um, the head of Sunway Future X Talent, a division under Sunway iLabs and the innovative edutech initiative called 42 Kuala Lumpur, based on the successful Eco42 in Paris and 42 Silicon Valley. Prior to joining Sunway Future X Talent, Jeff was the executive producer for BFM Media. And during his tenure there, he interviewed more than 6,000 entrepreneurs and innovative thinkers, a recognizable figure in the Malaysian startup ecosystem. He became the first Malaysian representative for the Asia Europe Foundation Young Leaders Summit in 2015. And in 2019, was the recipient of the US Department of State IVLP Edward R. Murrow Program on Leadership and Journalism. Thanks, Jeff, for joining us this afternoon. Um, our next speaker, an entrepreneur, um, someone I've known for more than 15 years, is uh, Mr. Stefan Ye. His title in itself talks about innovation because he is known as Events Experience for Compass Events Singapore. He took over Compass Event at a deficit and managed to turn the company to profitability within a year. Within three years, the company evolved from a talent management company to a full-fledged events management company specializing in conferences and exhibitions. The company landed its first major project within a year and has clients under its portfolio such as Vertex Ventures, Deloitte, IHH, and the Institute of Banking and Finance. So from Singapore, welcome and thank you, Stefan, for joining us. And our final speaker for this series is Ms. Sin Chansere Sophia. She is the founder and managing director of Sin C Creative Solutions, a 360 degree marketing agency. She operates across practice areas and industries, advising local and international clients through integrated creative solutions. With a decade of experience, Sophia has built teams and deployed marketing strategies across a variety of sectors and for firms, both small and large. She has combined her passion for social business and sustainability through conscious connection and has been investing in other industries as well to diversify her business. So once again, a big thank you to our four speakers for joining us. Now, um, before we launch into the first question, um, first round of questions for our participants, you know, if you have any questions through the course of this webinar that you would like to pose, uh, we would invite you to put it into the chat box, you know, just write it in. Uh, our coordinator will collate the questions and prepare it for the Q&A session in, towards the end of this webinar. So let me start off now with the macro view. The big picture, um, before we zoom in to the ground, uh, my, first, my first question goes to Rafale. You know, Rafale, you've been working for a while on the issue of skills at the OECD, and more recently on entrepreneurial skills. Uh, would you be able to explain to us quickly uh, what these skills are according to your analysis and what you have found? The floor is yours, Rafale. Thank you very much, TJ. Thank you to Julia. Thank you to the other experts for having uh, invited me, uh, giving me the possibility to address uh, uh, such a large number of people. Uh, TJ, I, I would like to echo Julia's uh, uh, intervention before and start from the end of my <laughs> point in the sense that I think that I think that skills are first and foremost uh, important policy goals. 
uh, and for two reasons. First, because they empower individuals and uh, help individuals uh, with their self-determination, decide about their own uh, uh, fate, and, and have a great impact on well-being. And this has been measured by the OECD and has become one of the key measures uh, uh, that the OECD try to uh, emphasize. Uh, it's about well-being, it's about this multidimensional approach to, to policy uh, evaluation. And the other point, if you want, uh, is uh, 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 at the level of society, because for policymakers, uh, uh, the support of skilled individuals uh, to you know, uh, deal with uh, uh, societal challenges is very important. We will need skilled individuals to help us with uh, climate change issues, with inclusiveness to make uh, our societies uh, more sustainable and just in, uh, in the future. Uh, of course, this sometimes can be uh, seen as an optimistic vision of skills, but this is a, a more complex discussion that we have not the time to, to uh, address in this, in this conversation. Now, let me go back to my narratives. And uh, let me say that uh, the skills are information that people use uh, uh, to perform tasks or to engage in uh, some actions, okay? Uh, and there is also a link between uh, skills and actions. Uh, is, uh, uh, you know, there's a uh, sort of cognitive dis dissonance in which people learn by doing uh, their, 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 no, their activities. Uh, and so uh, difficult uh, tasks like uh, uh, being a, a brain surgery, uh, surgeon requires a high level of skills uh, through study and practice. So, so you, you have the, the need to, to develop the skills uh, in, uh, in different ways. Uh, recently, or when in the last 10 years, so the OCD is putting increasing importance on uh, the skills that are not cognitive. So they're not numeracy or literacy, for instance, but they are the affective and behavioral uh, traits of individuals. And these are the non-cognitive skills. Within the, the non-cognitive skills, we uh, you know that there is uh, also called the transversal skills. There is the capacity to work with others, to be proactive, to be creative, uh, et cetera. Uh, and now the, uh, the, this, uh, the, the skills are, uh, you know, in this uh, in, in in this framework, we have valued very much the the, the, the possibility to have uh, entrepreneurial skills. That means that the individuals can be proactive, open to risk, uh, able to work with others, and uh, engage in uh, uh, very difficult tasks because they have this uh, drive uh, in, in in them. Uh, what we so it is it is about uh, changing, if you want, the mindset of of, of people and uh, uh, give them a new uh, <laughs> operation system, a new capacity, a, a different way to to function. And uh, what we have discovered is that uh, it is possible to affect both the cognitive skills of people, but also the non-cognitive skills of people by giving them specific uh, uh, instructions, uh, learning opportunities, and feedback from their activities. Uh, so this is a, 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 a very uh, you know, uh, comprehensive response to a, a, a difficult question. But the, 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 the point is that in today's uh, uh, economy and society, we really need uh, individuals to be uh, more capable, so to uh, contribute to society, to decide about their own destiny, and to be resilient, especially, uh, you know, this is a time in which we are exposed to different shocks, uh, you know, the, the pandemic, et cetera, the, the digital progress. So uh, an important point is to have uh, uh, people that are able to uh, be open and flexible to these continuous shocks to which they are exposed. And that's the reason why an ancient, so an old uh, conception of skills that was uh, 
mostly related to the cognitive skills is not sufficient because at a certain point you need these cognitive skills to evolve and to uh, be uh, um, responded to more diverse and sophisticated tasks. So that's the reason why uh, now we connect so much the non-cognitive and uh, the, the cognitive and the non-cognitive skills. Uh, and uh, a last point that I want to ma make is that this flexibility is also is also depending on the capacity or, or this capacity of learning to learn. There is uh, the one of the most important traits that. Uh, uh, skilled people have to acquire in, uh, in, in, in today's societies and, and economies. Uh, learning to learn seems to be, you know, it's not so, it's, it's easy to say, but it's difficult to put in practice because uh, in, a, in a world that is uh, dense of information, possibility for interactions and, for, and possibilities for actions, people have uh, to be able to decide what is important to learn? What is relevant for them to, to know? What kind of interaction are uh, relevant to, to, to undertake? And uh, with whom they want to, you know, to, 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 to generate these, uh, these interactions. So uh, I, would, uh, I would say that this is a, a modern narrative about skills. And uh, as you said at the beginning, entrepreneurial skills uh, match uh, this new way, this new conception very well, because uh, they uh, uh, help the individuals creating a new platform of knowledge, uh, you know, by this capacity of trespassing between uh, different domains, which is a characteristic of entrepreneurial spirit, uh, to, to be able to connect a different, uh, different area of knowledge, uh, different, uh, different groups uh, and, and different categories. So again, entrepreneurial skills are uh, a, a, an emphasization you know, of this uh, catalyzed the capacity of uh, this uh, learning to learn capacity. Thank you very much. I see that the time is up. Thank you very much, Rafale. You know, your phrase learning to learn is uh, gaining momentum in our chat box. Uh, there are already a few participants that have caught it. Um, over here in Singapore, we call it lifelong learning. But I think I like the phrase learning to learn. So thank you for sharing this with us. Let me move now to Jeff. You know, um, Jeff, in your line of work, uh, maybe later you can just give us a quick introduction to um, what you do over at 42 Kuala Lumpur. Um, but in your line of work, you interact with many entrepreneurs. You know, um, and if I were to pick some of the things that Rafale shared earlier, and in terms of resilience, uh, decision-making, uh, being open to risk, um, what has been your general observation on how these entrepreneurs have responded over this last year um, to the pandemic? Perhaps if you could share three or four observations, please. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Aria, for inviting me here. Thanks, TJ, uh, Julia, as well. I think um, I have to agree everything with Raphael actually said earlier on, um, because it's throughout the years, uh, it's always been that talk that talent is, you know, we're, we're not producing enough talent or, you know, in this part of the region, there's not enough uh, good talent that comes around and stuff, right? But actually, if we, if we peel the, the layer a little bit deeper, uh, it's that soft skills, it's that non-cognitive skills that's actually missing. Uh, and if you were to define what is a, an entrepreneur, you would actually notice that an entrepreneur would have very good non-cognitive skills, the very, very good soft skills, right? Because they are never, you know, a, a master of that one particular thing um, because they always would hire individuals who specialize in different things. And they are the one who's sort of like the jack of all trades, right? Which is basically to be a jack of all trades is you got to be able to, uh, you know, sort of understand every single layers, but give the trust to those who need to run it, right? So... Um, it's interesting because in 2020, uh, I, I played two roles, right? One is uh, I was part of the media field. Uh, I was overseeing, uh, you know, the large number of uh, startups in, in Malaysia and giving them sort of like uh, the spotlight and just understanding some of their pain points. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, at one point of time, just within the year 2020 itself, uh, I think I spoke to nearly about three to 4,000 uh, over like, you know, uh, startups and entrepreneurs 
because COVID was such a unique situation itself, right? Um, and then middle of the year, I, I switched over to education. Uh, and a big part of uh, what I'm doing now is actually to give an opportunity for anyone uh, above 18 years old uh, to learn some of these digital skills, coding, programming, but also develop these soft skills. Uh, and, and through this environment where it is absolutely free, so you know anyone with, with any sort of background can come in. Um, but also more importantly is that the way we teach is different so that learning to learn uh, phrase applies here uh, and it's actually within our blood itself because for us uh, there's no teachers, there's no classes, there's no tuition fee. So the only way for you to, to continually uh, you know, be hungry to learn is that you yourself got to be having that desire to learn, right? We're not going to call you if you don't come into to the campus tomorrow and you know, hey, you know, TJ, what happened? Why did you not come into school? We're not doing that, right? Um, it, it's, it's a way that we have now seen that there's so many people who really require uh, uh, this kind of new skills, right? But they just never had that capacity financially, especially, or just never had that, that um, financial risk uh, to, to go into doing upskilling, reskilling, uh, because it's just difficult, right? COVID has really presented a, a, a different challenge to everyone. In terms of like um, entrepreneurs and I guess like uh, observations of, you know, what has happened, um, and it's hard to label it because even in entrepreneurs, uh, it, it's such a wide frame, right? So from what I noticed that I felt really made an impact um, is entrepreneurs went back to the basics for me um, in the year 2020. Um, because, you know, if you look at like the definition of entrepreneur, it's all about, you know, being able to, uh, you know, like what Raphael mentioned, right? It's the adapt to risk, uh, you know, being able to uh, uh, collaborate with, with each other, finding opportunities, problem solving, right? Uh, and in the year 2020, a lot of entrepreneurs actually realized they had to go back to the basics. Uh, and these were things like collaborating uh, with, with each other. Uh, I, I personally had witnessed so many different startups, uh, you know, in, in, in spaces like FNB, for example, where immediately it was, was impacted um, because you can't, you know, do dine aims and there were a lot of FNBs were not on board of the digital train yet where, you know, you could do your online orders or deliveries and stuff, right? So there were so many uh, FNB operators who were stuck. Uh, and, and we saw them actually forming together an alliance and actually uh, learning uh, how to get on these platforms, how to actually encourage others, uh, you know, and, and actually going up to the, the, the restaurant owner next door and asking them like, hey, I'm actually getting on board, uh, you know, some of these delivery apps. Do you want to actually join as well, right? It's having that collaboration mindset, uh, whereas in, in pre-COVID days, it was always as competitor, right? I want to have more customers in my shop than the one the, the shop next door itself, right? But in COVID, that, that mindset has shifted. Um, and I think also the willingness to change. Uh, it, it was huge uh, in, in COVID. Um, you know, pre-COVID, there is, uh, I'm sure everyone knows about this joke, like who was your digital transformation uh, officer during uh, the year 2020? Was it A, the CEO, B, the CTO, uh, or... Uh, Am I still here? Because I think I lost my internet connection. For... We still hear you. We still hear you. For... All right. Sorry, All right. I, I lost my I lost my internet connection there. No worry. Um, yeah. So, like you know, there's that running joke, right? Like, who was your uh, digital transformation officer? Uh, the CEO, the CTO, uh, the CFO, or is it COVID nineteen? Right. Uh, and and everyone knew that. It's COVID-19 that was your digital transformation officer. Uh, and, and this is actually very true because pre-COVID days, uh, we had so many actually uh, platforms that can enable businesses to operate anywhere. Working from home, uh, it, it was possible pre-COVID. Uh, just no one, no one adopted it because why would you do that? Uh, you, you're paying rental spaces. Uh, you're, you're requiring your meetings to be done physically. Um, but that shift happened almost in, you know, instantly uh, because I think you know, entrepreneurs realized that we need to adapt to this change and there's no way around it. 
Uh, and realizing that actually a lot of businesses, uh, small businesses, have actually developed a lot of uh, you know amazing tools uh, locally. Yeah, and and also I think finally just to touch on, I know my time is up, but um, I think a lot more entrepreneurs were uh, uh, bringing up the issue of mental uh, health and being more aware of their employees, which I think is a really good step forward because it's something that the digital space needs to realize as well. Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, you know, I'm really liking how our chat box is moving today because um, the participants are really gleaning, you know, key points of our speakers. Um, thank you. Um, indeed, I would echo, I think, what Jeff said, that, um, you know, it, the whole situation forced a change. Over in Singapore, we had on Facebook a Hawkers United page that got set up. Um, and different hawkers, you know, began to post their businesses and what they provided online. So really, it was a catalyst for change. And after that, I think the more important thing is that even this year, uh, you still have this going on. Yeah. So there, there has been that move. So thanks very much, Jeff, for that sharing. Let's move now to our um, entrepreneur. Uh, first one, Stefan. Um, sorry, let me, let me, perhaps let me go to uh, Sophia first. My apologies. Yeah. Let, let ladies first, yeah. Uh, for Sophia, um, you're in the creative line. You know, the creative and marketing sector is very much dependent on demand from companies for your services. How did the pandemic change um, your particular sector? And what were the things that you had to do to ensure that the business remained resilient and was moving on? Um, okay. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, this is uh, my very first time to actually actually be a speaker. Um, in terms of um, what has happened uh, to our country, the, the pandemic hit us in, I think, in end of February, early March. Um, in a lot of business, um, there are, of course, uh, businesses that didn't adjust themselves well. Uh, because of you know different people different mindsets um which after you know a few months they uh, have failed um, very badly i'm not sure about the internal but the company uh, you know for example a travel agent is completely closed down and some business that are uh, able to to adjust uh, their mindset and their whole organization quickly they able to continue in um uh, in a uh, stable pace or in a very difficult pace, but the first time it hit us, it was uh, very hard for everyone. Even in terms of my business, which we basically focus on digital, um, it it causes uh you know we have to deal with uh the employee, and in a country like us, a lot of them be quite involving with their. Uh, with their uh, children, even if they, sorry to say, even if they're 27 or 30. So as one of the entrepreneur, for me, I had to not just deal with my employee, but I had to deal with the emotions that, and the pressure their family put them in as well and to keep the business going while dealing on my personal staff and the client part. So for me, um, during this pandemic, I always, but my first priority is, of course, the client, but my always employee internally always come first because like one of the, you know, one of my, um, uh, one of the entrepreneurs that really inspired me is, he is one of, of them is Jake Ma, is to take care of the employee first, make sure they are happy and then with, they will serve the client. Um, so I deal, uh, it, it was hard for me to deal with the employee and, some of them came to a point where they didn't actually able to come to work anymore. So I I I understand. I, I mean, um, I always been a flexible person since I was younger. So I was able to adapt to that quite fast. Um, so in terms of that, and then uh, some of the employee, I I cut them down as well because they're new and because uh, of their you know. Their family issue side that they worry about uh, being infected. 
uh, but the, the one that stay with me longer and able to work from home. So I have just, you know, some able to come to work and some actually work from home. So I managed through that. Um, it was a challenge for the first two weeks, but after a while it was fine. Uh, when it hit first, uh, our business is kind of, a lot of uh, clients are panic, but it also quite booming. But after three months, when things didn't get uh, picked up, a lot of clients um, actually postponed or canceled. So there's a lot of pressure in terms of uh, you know running a business. And so I started to uh, like what Jack mentioned. Uh, I start to collaborate. You know, I start to talk to uh, different companies. I wasn't just focused on client base anymore. I was focused on on other businesses as well. Let's see how we can work together. If the income comes in, it's less, but at least something comes in to make it stable because I cannot afford to just close the, stop my company or close my company quick, uh, just like that. Because it's also not not just business, but in some of my employees as well. Uh, at that time, you can't find any job. Nobody will, you know, give you a job, and a lot of uh, companies cut down uh, fifty to sixty percent until uh, most big companies they cut down until. Um, October and some December, even though things picked up in um, September, October, November, and December. Yeah, and um, uh, in terms of um, a general public, um, a lot of them learn how to order food online. Uh, so besides the pharmacy industry, the food delivery are extremely booming, even until now. Because we actually has, a, I'm not sure it's called second or third or fourth breakout, and this time it's a bit serious. Um, it still haven't knocked down yet, uh, but I think our country we, we are not able to completely lock down because you know it will hurt people who are selling food on the street, uh, a guy who uh, selling drink on a cart. So um, are we still able to work every day? But yes, a lot of. Uh, especially restaurant, they able to uh, go on the apps and diversify, not, not really diversify, but understand the, the delivery. So I think from uh, app used to be just for uh, people who's from 15 to 25 or 30, but now even a generation at 50 or 60, they know how to order food from uh, an app. Yeah, and another side that also hurting is that it's very easy, I'm not uh, very sure about other countries, but in here, it's, it's extremely easy to start a new business. So uh, after hitting for the first three months, the next three months was there are digital uh, or freelancers who do social media, digital media. It's increased from probably around 100 to five, 600. I think you can see everywhere. You can see all the ads, all the digital ads everywhere. And of course, as a customer, everyone would just go for someone that is extremely cheap. So it's just hurting, you know, those who are like, like especially my company, who are have done it for years. And we have a, a, a price that, you know, suitable for proper value. But in uh, the next three months, which happened from March, it just, everyone is just off for a very competitive price. So in terms of that, it's, it's hurting, uh, it was booming at first and then it's hurting a, a digital business as well. Thanks very much, Sophia. Yeah. Um, I, you know, from your sharing, um, the most, most um, important point that I really caught was the fact that for you as the so-called CEO, the MD, um, having to really extend empathy to your staff, to your employees um, as a skill. And I think that is very important uh, for entrepreneurs to have, especially if you are in a community. Um, and I think as a boss, you know, um, that is even harder because most of the time people look at bosses as being the ones driving you know, one thing to hit, um, meet your bottom line, etc. But I think in times like these, to really be resilient enough yourself um, to be able to then extend that to your employees. So 
So I think that's something um, important for all our participants, um, especially those who are entrepreneurs to, to consider. Um, so thank you very much, Sophia, for your sharing. Let me then now move to Stefan. So your industry probably would have been the most impacted uh, being someone from the events and mice, you know, um, the impact must have been significant. Um, perhaps you can share with us over the course of this past year, you know, what did you have to do to pivot your business and also to remain resilient amidst this storm? All right. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, firstly, to the first three speakers. I think uh, their input has been very valuable. And uh, basically, I don't have a lot of content to add already because they basically uh, spoke about a lot of things I want to talk about too. But let me let me quickly summarize and um, let me deliver really the bad news guy. I'm the bad news guy. Um, so the, the so thank you for the question. Um, the effects of COVID really has affected many sectors, and possibly one of the most impacted factor would be the mice industry. Uh, just for for anyone who is not in the industry, um, mice stands for meetings, incentives, conferencing, and exhibitions. So what we really do is we rely on international travelers, right, to attend the event. But without international travel, with the, with the situation these days, there are no events. And it was even more evident during the circuit breaker where Singapore went into a lockdown. Uh, so as an event organizer, uh, I told myself at the start of the pandemic, uh, about March 2020, that Singapore would be out of the pandemic by July out of pandemic by July, I was telling myself that. After all, right, Singapore as a whole relies a lot on tourism. We've got national carrier, we have a lot of attractions, and international tourism accounts for 4.1% of Singapore's GDP back in 2017. So like uh, what we will say locally, la, die, die, show, okay one. Um, but unfortunately, just like Justin Bieber's song, it was a case of never say never. So the first thing that I did was to react fast. Um, react and react fast. So you know, events are not happening, right? So I quickly identified the sources of income that is possible in the next coming months, if nothing changes. So no physical events are permissible. Let's do virtual and let's do it really well. So I very quickly gathered resources and started to reach out to potential clients very quickly. And within a week, um, all our proposals were out. Um, and the second thing is, um, I think is to, is to ask for help when you can. So because we are all deep in the trenches and it is a time to try and help one another, even if they are competition. Um, some would say that the events industry is a rather cutthroat place to be. But if we choose to align with the right people, you will find that there are these supportive groups who are willing to share about what they know. So we, we share our experiences, we refine, we improve, and we try to execute the next event better. Uh, lastly, my last point would be as uh, event organizers, um, we, we don't listen very well. So I think that my third point would be to listen. Um, because um, event organizers, right, we, we tend to think that we know it all uh, when it comes to event planning. Uh, so after all, right, isn't, isn't this what our clients pay us for? But by keeping our ears close to the ground and listen, we listen to what our clients' pain points are and coming up with attainable suggestions. Uh, this allows a deeper trust between the client and us. Um, and I think this will really pay off if um, you, you see this client, this one-time client come back to you as a return customer and you know that your efforts are paying off because they're coming back for a second time, isn't this what we all want? So I think this is a very quick uh, three-pointer sum up of uh, how I'll do this. Thanks very much, Stefan. Uh, if you just hold on, I will get back to you for a second round of questions. But just before that, I think, you know, if I may just quickly um, pick out uh, a couple of points that he shared. One, as entrepreneurs, let's not be afraid to ask for help. Yeah. Um, but I like what you said because, you know, there will always be groups, individuals, or communities where there is that synergy in alignment and where you can help each other. Yeah. Um, and I think your point on listening, I would say it would apply to everyone, you know, all our participants that are here, whether you are in policy making, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you are in academia, um, it is a skill. Yeah, it is a skill. And it is also a mindset because you have to 
switch and to tell yourself, okay, I am wanting to listen so that I can glean, I can learn, and then I can move on. Yeah. So let's move, you know, uh, I think all our speakers have shared about uh, what has happened, what are their observations. Um, I want to now look at success, to succeed, right? Because um, really all of us are hoping for post-pandemic recovery, economic rebound. So Stefan, you know, for you, what do you think would be the top three mindset, mindsets um, and skills that entrepreneurs and those in this ecosystem, they need to embrace in a post-pandemic world? Okay. Um... Let me, let me start by saying this, that uh, to set this context, I may not be the best person to ask about mindsets. I think Raphael and Jeff and Sophia, they, they, are, they, 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 they have a lot more credentials than me, but perhaps I can offer an alternative angle. Um, and uh, the first uh, alternative mindset that I have uh, also will relate to my first point uh, from my earlier part uh, is uh, to, be, to be ready to help. So sometimes I, I feel that the, the best way to grow but you cannot quantify it by monetary gains. If someone needs your help, be it connecting with a vendor, be it dispensing advice, I would say you can provide those resources to the best of your abilities. Uh, by doing so, you might just help that someone in need. Um, you might just help them to tie over a very difficult time and you will never know when the favor will be returned or in the worst, worst case, when you need that favor, right? Not to say that you really want them the favor to be returned. Um, the second thing, alternative mindset that I present today is um, to the, um, it pertains to the concept of an entrepreneur. Uh, some would akin an entrepreneur like Elon Musk, right? Up there, uh, tiredless, doesn't need to eat, doesn't need to sleep, look great on camera, and generally unaffected by the storm, wherever it may come. But the truth we told is we as entrepreneurs are very, very human. So when there is a time for you to, you, you need to connect with how you're feeling at a particular moment, uh, don't dispense that easily. Don't, don't think that, oh, it's not important. Um, try to connect with that because I think that is very important to mental health. So allow yourself to feel and to be human. Um, and uh, my last point is um, one of my favorite mantras. Uh, and also uh, very much like Sophia, uh, this is my first time being on a panel. And, uh, but uh, I would say that my third point is to say yes when opportunity comes and then you think about how to do it later. Uh, so opportunities don't come that easily, in a, particularly in a very crowded uh, marketplace, right? So um, when they do present themselves um, and they do come, say yes first, and then you can try to Google, you try to YouTube how to do it later. Um, but when you get those opportunities, I say you grab it. So that's just my very quick three points. Thanks very much, Stefan, for saying yes and then thinking about it later. Yeah. Uh, let me move on. Let me move on to Sophia. Um, I would ask you the same question as well. Um, Sophia, you know, where you are in Cambodia, perhaps, um, what do you think are the top three mindsets or skills that entrepreneurs would need to embrace or they need to have in a post-pandemic world? Um, so I actually agree and I have a very similar mindset to um, Stefan. Um, and one really good point that he just um, uh, 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 gave me a realization was always say yes to the opportunity. And I actually, after running my own company for a while, uh, I always been practicing it. Uh, every opportunity that comes, that I, I rarely say no, and then I will go back and think about it and discuss, and then I will contact you know, those people who is in the, the industrial um, to advise or to help me out. So uh, that way, uh, it's also open up the way I learn, uh, more skills, more learning, different industrial. So every learning is never bad or, or negative. It's always a good. Um, and it's also make you able to understand the industry and be flexible as well. Because, you know, if you, for example, um, um, in marketing, if I learn about tech industrial, 
there is still an opportunity for me to actually come up with a new creative idea or a business idea model in uh, that specifically a uh, specifically tailored IT company. So my first point will be, um, you know, I always say just the opportunity, like what's the fancy and come back, think about it. A uh, second of all, be flexible. Um, we all like, for example, like this COVID time, this pandemic really forcing a lot of business to open up their mind, be flexible, otherwise they cannot survive. And in Cambodia, I've seen myself, uh, you know, maybe they are a bit older generation, I'm not sure. I can't really uh, point out on that, but uh, I can see that some business who resist to, to adapt or uh, are too strong in some of their core business and didn't adjust to, to, to during this period of time has failed completely closed down and until now it still hasn't uh the, the, some companies still close um so that will be my uh, second point and the third one will be um be well, what is it called uh have a mindset of stable and not able to panic because you are a leader uh i, I might be deep down inside might be panic but if i were to be panic my employer will, will feel worse so the last thing you want to do is to create a lot of panics, but to really think it through, uh, try to calm yourself down, uh, discuss, you know, with other, uh, you know, uh, experienced friends, uh, other entrepreneurs, uh, and calm yourself down. And then so you know what are the next steps to do instead of, of you know, uh, getting panic, uh, uh, take, uh, you know, actions uh, too quickly. And then it also, you know, give your clients and your employee to, to, to feel, uh, to have this pressure. So uh, every time it's not just about this a pandemic, but every single time we have you know, any big client who's pulling themselves away, and then I would be panic about you know, operational costs or income, then it's always been, um, I believe it's, it, it's one of the key to, as an entrepreneur, especially during the pandemic, Thanks very much, Sophia. Um, I, I like the point um, of, you know, the entrepreneur remaining composed, having that composure. Yeah. You know, I, I think of the picture of the duck, right? There's, there's that very famous picture, the duck, very calm above the waters, but paddling like crazy underneath. Yeah, I think that is something for entrepreneurs to always uh, have in mind. Yeah, because you do bring stability. Um, before I move on to Jeff, you know, just a quick shout out to our participants. You know, if you have any questions, um, by the way, all of you have been very great in, you know, um, putting your comments on the chat box. But if you have any questions that you want to um, pose to our speakers, please feel free to put it into the chat box as well. Yeah. So, Jeff, um, same question to you too. Yeah, you know. What to you, what would be your top three on the charts for mindsets as well as skills? Yeah, I think I I, I do like uh what Sophia mentioned about uh saying yes uh to more things or to anything that comes across uh uh you know inbox and stuff like that, right? And I think uh, Stefan was also replying in one of the chat box and you know he was basically also you know implying the same. Uh it's just saying yes. Um, so I, I, instead of like maybe giving like three kind of tips or mindsets, maybe I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into each one of them if I can. I won't take much time because I know I took up from my previous one already. So, um, so the first one is obviously resilient, right? So we have to be resilient. We know that, right? But how do you actually be resilient? Something that I think people will be questioning. Um, so I would actually put it in just like, you know, Sophia saying yes, is to get out of your comfort zone. Um, and I think that is a very good step for you to actually be resilient um, because changes like COVID and, and you know, you, you know, what's going to happen in the future, we, we're not quite certain of, but these kind of changes uh, can happen very so sudden. And, and why we always uh, struggle with it is because it pushes out of our comfort zone. We, we never, you know, put in that situation before. Um, so how do you sort of get out of your comfort zone um, is I feel like you can, you can do things where, 
uh, you follow like Google's 80 percent, 80 to 20 percent rule, right? So 80 percent is you focus on what you are comfortable with, with what you're doing in your day to day on your business. But the 20 percent is to maybe take that that things that is outside of your comfort zone. Uh, you know, whether it is saying yes to that project where you have no idea actually how it actually could start. Uh, and then maybe from there is I think Stefan was mentioning in the chat, you figure it out later on, right? You just say yes first. Uh, that could be part of your 20% of building that resilient mindset or, or, or nature within you, right? It, it really helps a lot. Um, the other is, is, is the hunger. Uh, and I feel we have seen more of this now. Um, the appetite to actually try uh, new things. Uh, so, you know, it's great that, you know, we've got this, you know, continuous learning, lifelong learning, uh, learning to learn and you know, all kinds of things. So in, in a way, it, it actually encourages you to try new things, right? So as, as much as we can, and how do we do this is, you'll be surprised a lot of the, uh, you know, your companies, uh, you would have actually staff who are coming from different generations. Uh, look at how they are uh, using, uh, you know, tools or how are their day to day and, and what do they think about, uh, you know, knowing about how to actually contribute to the company itself, right? So, uh, you know, we always have a very uh, top down approach, but uh, in, in order to be able to build that resilient uh, mindset or, or in the company itself is to have a bottom up approach, right? So maybe you can do workshops or trainings uh, with your staff who are, you know, much lower down the field to actually get them to give contributions on how they feel the company can do better and stuff, right? So learning from the ones who are from all kinds of uh, positions, right? Uh, even interns uh, are, are great as well, right? Because they come from different generations. Uh, and then the other one is the openness, which comes back to learning from different people, uh, is, is like that duck example, uh, you know, you're as an entrepreneur from the head itself, you're always very calm at the top, but you're, you know, scrambling at the bottom. Um, and, and openness is actually all about trying to create a transparent environment for your employees and even for your customers as well, right? Um, it, is, it is okay to sometimes um, uh, admit that you failed in this area or it did not meet certain expectations as long as you are very transparent about it, right? And not just trying to cover up your, your, your steps. Uh, during, uh, you know, COVID time, a lot of businesses who you know did try to open, uh, and and they had strict SOPs in place, you know, face mask and all these kind of things. But you can never say you know you are you are going to be protected from COVID at all times. And there are some you know instances where businesses have a, a positive case, but they immediately come out being very transparent about you know what are the some issues that happen and how did they actually manage this. When you be very transparent, you build that trust uh, within your employees. And if, you know, the, the unfortunate circumstances where you have to let someone go, they, they understand your pain. They understand your decision in doing this. So I feel it's like, you know, that, that there's, there's a lot of ways that companies can be uh, more open. Uh, and, and, and one is that, you know, it, it really helps to build trust as well. So yeah, those are like the three things that I think, uh, you know, will be pretty good steps. Thanks very much, Jeff. And finally, Rafale. You know, um, from from your role in OECD, mm, with with all that has been shared, where do you think the education and training institutions fit in? What is their role in all this? Um, how can they promote more skills uh, for entrepreneurship and innovation in the next generation? Thank you very much, uh, TJ. It's been uh, very interesting to listen to, to the other panelists. And uh, I think that is emerging this idea that entrepreneurs are individuals within uh, entrepreneurship ecosystems. So they are not alone. They emerge from communities. And I think that this is an important message also for the higher education institutions and the training institutions. Uh, at the OCD, in, in the skills strategy center, you know, there was this... Uh, 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 this, uh, this approach, this framework, dividing uh, skills policy into developing skills, activating skills, and using skills. So, and education policy was uh, traditionally in the first part, so about developing skills. I think that now, especially with the pandemic and with uh, digital uh, revolutions and, and changes, uh, the challenge for the uh, education and training institutions is to engage with the three 
dimension. So the development, the activation, and the use, they have to be as close as possible to the entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem that we are discussing here. Uh, and this has been, uh, and uh, uh, you know, I have to apologize because I don't know much about the Asian institutions, but uh, in Europe, in America, or in Latin America, where I'm working uh, uh, in this moment, uh, it, uh, it can be a, an immense cultural shock for these institution, institutions to become porous, you know, to open the doors to the entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem, to, to be able to connect and to leverage on their ecosystem to give students the opportunity to experience real, uh, uh, you know, real tasks. Uh, to exchange with entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs like Sofia or Stefan and, and, and to, to get to know these people, to get to connect before they have finalized the development of the skills. So everything has to be done at once. Uh, and so what, what, what they need to do, they need to, the institution need to embrace a new culture, need to embrace a new governance systems because, uh, you know, the businesses or the, or the, the local representatives need to be inside the uh, governance of higher education institutions and need, importantly, uh, new professional figures that can fill the gap between higher education institutions or training institutions and uh, uh, outside world. Sometimes this is natural. We know University of Applied Science, community colleges, they function in this way, but research institutions that are very important because they have a very high quality and high level of uh, information and, and skills, if you want, they have still a gap. They mind the gap between the research universities and the real economy. Uh, now we, you know, uh, we go in uh, in certain terrain because we don't know still what are the practices and what are the outcomes when uh, uh, an institu an education institution does decide to engage with innovation and entrepreneurship. They accept to step in, uh, you know, a new uh, land. Uh, and so, what is the idea basically? Is the idea that innovation in uh, there is no more frontal lessons, so especially after COVID, I think that the university will focus really on group work, on that kind of mentorship that you need to really empower the individuals. There is a need to create community of learning. And we have seen that in some places like Ecole Carandeux in Paris, there is this uh, idea of uh, a learning program, a gamified learning program that is on three years in which there are no teachers, there are no professors, and it's everything is about peer learning. Does it work? Um, yes, in the sense the labor market really recognizes the skills of the people. Now the question is, is it possible to democratize this approach to everyone? And there we have to understand if a student of philosophy or history can also benefit to, to be exposed uh, to this kind of, uh, of experiences, to change the mindset, to become more entrepreneurial. And uh, why are important that, why is very important that we understand these practices and the outcomes? So what is, because now it's all about inputs, no? You should be entrepreneurial, you should be innovative, but to, we, we, we talk with the business schools and of course there is a, 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 a phenomenon of, of selection of, of the group. And then you of course have already entrepreneurial people that, you know, uh, so it's a sort of echo chamber, but we, we, we want to know about the outcomes. So we will be able to adjust the education models, also the new innovation and entrepreneurship education models to a more uh, structured and more diversified population because we need to understand what are the practices, because this is super important, because once you have the practices right, you can democratize and go to the lifelong learning, which is very delicate, because there people have very limited amount of time, uh, very, they have uh, limited uh, openness, uh, and uh, there is also a financial constraint. You cannot engage them in four years program, in four year program. So. Uh, the understanding practices outcomes is important to democratize innovation and is important to provide learning to learn. 
there is always the menace. There is always the challenge of mission overload. Because let's go back to beginning. Uh, higher education institutions or education and training institutions are part of entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystems. They are actors, they can be drivers, but they cannot be alone in the sense that, uh, you know, education policy or skills policy is not the only one that you need to activate. It's not the only policy that you need to activate to promote entrepreneurship. You need uh, complementarities, you need uh, a platform of policies, so industrial, digital, etc. To Otherwise, what you have is a brain drain. You, know, people, you form people that are not adapted to your, your, your ecosystem and they fly to the Silicon Valley, London, uh, you know, Singapore, etc. Uh, but the message is that we have activated a cultural and policy revolution, and we need people like you, DJ, like Stefan, like Jess, like Sophia, to ally with us, to help us understanding what works, what doesn't work, and what is the, the, the responses that we have to give to, to the future of work and society, and also to the present of work and society, because that's become a little bit challenging. I don't know if you noticed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rafael. Um, on behalf of the entrepreneurs, we say yes first to your proposition. <laughs> yeah, and then we will think about it and worry about it later. Um, thank you so much to all our speakers for your sharing. I think it was uh, really very meaningful um, and from the heart, and I appreciate that. Um, in the remaining moments that we have, I know I will hand the floor to Lena. Uh, because there have been a few questions that have come in. So, Lena, over to you. Yes, thank you, DJ, for handing the floor to me. And thank you for embracing a very interesting discussion to all of the speakers, in which we can see many comments and determinations from audience to remain upscaling during this past 30 minutes. So, moving forward to the Q&A session, although it's been discussed in the chat box, by the audience says, and most of speakers also highlight the importance of non-cognitive skills. Let's hear up from the speaker's perspective on the actual difference between skills and attitudes. From the entrepreneurs itself, uh, I would like to address to the three entrepreneurs first. So what do you think the difference between skills and attitudes and Yes, skills can be taught or learned, but uh, does attitude can be learned or taught? Uh, how do you embrace it in your company? So I would like to give the floor first to Stefan, maybe. Stevan Is it because I, I muted myself first? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, to be honest. Um, Having skills, uh, you can learn skills. You can learn skills from institutions. You can learn skills from people. Um, and when it comes to mindsets, I think that is a journey. A journey that is, um, you, you can only embark this journey if you are, um, okay, maybe let me put it this way. I didn't, uh, maybe I just put it in a more personal context. I did not used to speak like this. I am not the person I am today. Uh, five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I didn't, I couldn't speak very well. I was very uncomfortable with myself. Um, I'm slightly awkward in social situations. And uh, being in events, that means that I have to try to get along with people, try to get along with my vendors. I, being an entrepreneur means I need to try to get along with my staff um, and be, uh, have an empathic view um, of their challenges, listen to them. So I think it's a journey. Um, you can learn certain skill sets from the schools. They can teach you how to, for example, uh, do the PL of your company, right? But the key thing here is really um, as you go along, you need to pair this, fuse this, or complement this with soft skills, uh, listening. Uh, and th that is actually a journey. You don't get this overnight. You don't learn this from someone. You learn this through mainly like the school of hard knocks. So that is where I think uh, that's my view. Back to you, Lena. Thank you, Savan. Uh, move ahead. Maybe we would like to hear from the women entrepreneurs in here. Sophia, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I think you're still mute. 
Okay, sorry, sorry, Lena. Okay, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, again, um, I agree a lot of things that Stefan just mentioned earlier. Uh, for me, um, of course, uh, when it comes to skill and attitude, um, attitude for me will be, let's say 60 to 70% important, but skill has to be there. But again, if I were to choose someone very skillful, so I have to deal someone very skillful with, let's say, um, unpleasant attitudes, I would actually love to love to choose someone um, with a great attitude because again, like Stefan mentioned, skill can be taught. Um, and through, through my um, 10 years, more than 10 years experience, um, someone who has a great attitude, because a great attitude comes with, you know, being hardworking, being passionate, being a team, uh, 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 working as a team. Uh, for me and my experience is uh, that that person will have a long uh, future and more successful with someone who's actually just of a skill and uh, 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 less of a, a, a great attitude. Thank you, Sophia, for sharing your perspective. Uh, next, move forward to Jeff. Uh, this is your company's business models, I think. So uh, please, Jeff, over to you. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll just explain um, how we are uh, teaching uh, yeah, individuals here, right? So, um, and, and why I think, you know, skills, uh, although they're, they're necessary, um, but what we try to instill is an attitude where we want to create this knowledge sharing ecosystem. Uh, so Raphael mentioned about, you know, peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning and stuff, right? So this is what we do in, in 42 Kuala Lumpur. Um, so, you know, there's no teachers and there's no classes, right? So the first step is generally they will do a logic test, uh, which enables us to filter out those who may have that certain mindset in understanding, uh, uh, you know, what's to actually, you know, go on for the for the next step stuff, right? Uh, because we teach coding, so it's it's important to have basic logic skills. Uh, that's the only requirement per se, right? And then we put them in this four weeks boot camp, uh, where each day they will have to invest up to seven to ten hours every single day, including weekends or public holidays, nonstop for twenty eight days. Um, at the end of it. Uh, we don't just select uh, the students who achieve the highest scores uh, in the exams and in the programs uh, mm -hmm. or the, the daily challenges. Uh, at, at the end of it, we actually take into consideration of how they have helped other peers who may have not come from any sort of uh, coding programming background and share that knowledge itself. Uh, what we evaluate is, you know, in each project, they, they need to have two of their peers to evaluate their work. Uh, and then we look at the comments that is given by their peers about how the student was actually, uh, you know, acceptive to criticism or uh, how this peer actually shared some of the, the knowledge that he or she may have in certain areas. So we take into consideration about the attitude of someone because for us, we are giving education for free uh, and, and that in that program, uh, needs to have people with similar uh, mindset uh, and hence the attitude part is really important right do you even do you even you know basic things do you even just take care of your space right so every morning we see uh, our individuals just taking sanitizer bottles and you know wiping down their tables without even us asking for it because they believed in that vision of we all are here to help one another and hence naturally in four weeks you will develop that behavior of helping others because you realize you are now in that ecosystem. So being around the community is really important to instill this kind of behavior. Okay, thank you, Jeff. It's very interesting to know that the key is peer-to-peer -peer learning. And uh, Rafael, uh, maybe you would like uh, to share what uh, has been OECD uh, does to embrace that non-cognitive skills or attitude ecosystem. There is a lot of uh, work about uh, non-cognitive skills done by the OECD. Uh, let me say a, a disclaimer. It might be a sort of Immanuel Kant uh, category in the sense that we superimpose the existence of non-cognitive skills because we are able to measure the cognitive skills and then we are 
a little bit challenged by measuring the non-cognitive skills. So everything that was complex and difficult to define has been set, has been put in the box of the non-cognitive skills. But these are still very important because define who we are, how we activate what we know, and how we relate and donate, uh, transmit what we know to the others, to our tasks, to our, uh, you know, to our life and society. So non-cognitive skills are as important as cognitive skills. Once the OECD realized that, they some, it's, it's now some, some years, uh, activated a lot of uh, um, analysts and like me and people and researchers, they are trying to uh, define, understand and uh, work towards that direction. There is still, a, is, this is a journey though, it's, it's still difficult because if you see our um, uh, uh, tools like uh, PISA, I don't know if you are familiar with that, is uh, a test for uh, kids under 15 years old that you know, measure the capacity in literacy, numeracy and science. And then there is PIAC, that is a sort of PISA for adults. There are still focusing on cognitive skills However, there are innovation in PISA like uh, global competence. So how you connect dif different uh, knowledge uh, or, or different information, how you function in a digital environment. There are not necessarily cognitive uh, attitude, but a uh, trait of the personality. As Jeff said, you know, it's, uh, it's the capacity to relate with the others, et cetera. There, there's still time, we will need time, uh, uh, behavioralist are all already you know, going in that direction. And we support, of course, this. Uh, and the, the fact that the OECD has a program, program on entrepreneurship education and specifically value that, as I said before, is an attempt to go deeper in the understanding of non-cognitive dimensions in skills. Thank you, Ravail, for sharing your thoughts uh, based on OECD's practice. So uh, I'm afraid it would, this will be the last questions that would be discussed by all the speakers, but we would like to know uh, your perspective from the entrepreneur side first. Um, uh, what do you think is upskilling of workforce become inevitable? And since uh, the pandemic has caused uh, the layoff of some companies to get unemployment. So in the future, how does this affect the recruitment process? For instance, referring to your company's uh, business model. So since Stefan is, has answered the first questions, uh, I know I would like to move the hand the floor to uh, Jeff first. Jeff, over to you. Um, it's, it's hard actually. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, probably uh, I lost my train of thought. Could you just repeat that again while I try to pull it, pull I, it back together? I guess. So has, has upskilling of workforce ah, yeah. becomes inevitable? And then the second question is in the future, uh, will it affect the recruitment process in your company when you select your team? Yeah, so 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 about upskilling, right? Um, because I was I was, I was thinking back of uh, stats when we mm -hmm. had when we 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 opened up our 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 school, uh, so we had about uh nearly three thousand of our people registering for forty two Kuala Lumpur, uh, mm -hmm. when we launched the website back in, uh, July end of July twenty twenty, uh, and and when we started enrolling uh small groups of individuals into this you know four weeks boot camp to test them out. Uh, we did a lot of survey, uh, where are they coming from? Uh, actually, we initially thought a lot of them are going to come from the fresh graduates or people looking for uh, a different form of learning uh, and, and not really industry experts. Uh, but we were surprised to find about 45% of the individuals who are here uh, in 42 Kuala Lumpur uh, used to be in an industry on a junior level position. Uh, and when we asked them, why did you actually leave your job in the year 2020? Uh, or you know, we actually first asked them, how did you leave your job? Uh, more than half of them actually said that they resigned or uh, had to leave their job. Uh, 
uh, and and we asked them why did that happen and stuff and you know what's the aim here of you actually leaving your job or you resigning from your job they were not forced to leave by the way these are you know they they left their job for their own reason and they mentioned self upskilling uh, they decided to take one year off uh, to learn as much as they can because they've been in this junior level position for far too long and COVID has had a huge impact that they can't level up, right? So we've noticed that, you know, I think the self-upscaling thing is going to be ever more uh, uh, important, but the way it is implemented has to change because it's not new. Uh, I don't think, you know, in, in any company, upscaling, rescaling is a new thing. It's just that we finally have a word for it, but it's been going on for decades now, right? Uh, and in terms of the hiring or recruitment side of things, um, I, you know, I, I won't really have much to say on that because I don't, you know, come from that industry. Uh, although there are companies that look at us as a recruitment agency because we are training the talents up, but uh, you know, I, I feel you know the model is just will change ever, you know, uh, because of the way that we are we're going about with education at the moment. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Very interesting to know uh, the recruitment process in your company. Um, but I know some of you will uh, trying to answer the questions, but I'm afraid we are running out of time. So apologize for that. And uh, uh, we will. Uh, I just want to share the information that we will post the summary and post materials in a few days after the webinar. So don't worry, all the recordings and new summary will be posted at our web, www.area.org. So before it close, I would like to hand the floor again to Julia. Thank you to all of the speakers. Thank you, Lina. But uh, in case, uh, in addition to Jeff, there's anyone who wants <laughs> very, very quickly to address the question, the time to raise your hand is now. Yes, I was sure that Rafael wanted to ask something. So please. <laughs> No, because, go ahead. because upskilling is a, is a very important uh, issue and uh, who has the possibility to engage in upskilling is very fortunate. The problem is that the system that will emerge after the pandemic is incredibly exclusive in the sense that there are many people that risk to be uh, at the mar to languish at the margins of societies and labor markets. So it would be important that also the private sector helps uh, policies to be uh, inclusive and to be sure that nobody uh, you know is stuck in that position uh, uh, in, uh, in you know for the long in a long time thank you very much sorry julia thank you and to complement with that i think we are really seeing this trend in southeast asia partly because uh, maybe you know some higher education and training institution are not you know same quality as uh, in other places in the world, but we are really seeing the business sector, in some cases, becoming a leader in providing training, upskilling and reskilling, which I think it's a very interesting trend uh, for the Southeast Asia region. But anyway, having said that, it's really time to close. We are really a little bit behind schedule. I think we had a very rich and interesting conversation. Uh, the two keywords perhaps uh, were learn how to learn and also collaboration, because I think that uh, we, we talked a lot about how because of COVID, now collaboration is really a necessity. And it's something that often, even you know, different leaders around the world uh, have recognized that uh, the traditional economic, economic model so far has put maybe too much emphasis on competition and too little on collaboration, but we need collaboration to solve global challenges, including you know, to try to find a solution to the pandemic we are currently living. So I think it was a very timely discussion. I would like to thank again uh, the speakers. It was really great to have you with us. Uh, thank you, Raffaella, Jeff, uh, uh, Stefan, and Sofia. Uh, I didn't know, Sofia, it was your first panel, but uh, I hope you will be able to get back uh, with us uh, soon. Um, and let me also share with all participants that uh, we will be back in four weeks' time. And next time, we will discuss uh, opportunities, but also risks uh, linked to emerging deep technologies. Uh, thank you, TJ. Thank you, Lina. And I think probably it's now, now time to close the meeting. Thank you much. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Bye, everyone. It was a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank Likewise. You well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Hopefully we will shake hands soon. <laughs>